So today we're gonna to be talking about a topic that a lot of you guys continue to ask me on. So we're just gonna like compile it all into one video and that is like a complete access port guide. We're gonna be talking about values of what you're gonna be seeing on the access port, features of the access port, how to go through the parameters of the access port, what to set up, what to look out for and more. So this is going to be pretty universal across any car that takes an access port with the exception of some of the features and the values that you're going to be seeing because some cars will see different values than other ones for say like Nissan to Subaru to Volkswagen to Audi, it's going to differ slightly across each chassis and each car. So let's get into some access port stuff. So to install an access port, incredibly easy. You can already see I have mine mounted up here in the vent. I will link this vent mount down below because people always ask me where I get that one. Uh, I've also got it routed through an old switch here in the dash so that way this wire isn't going absolutely everywhere. But all you do to hook this thing up is you go down to your OBD2 port. I'm trying to unplug mine right now to plug it in to show you guys. You just plug it into your OBD2 port down there. Mine doesn't want to come out. Plug it into the OBD2 port, plug it into the access port, turn the key to ignition. See, look, now mine's going on because I just kind of unplugged it and plugged it back in. Turn the key ignition to accessory, and then it's gonna walk you through on the access port how to install this thing. It's incredibly simple. I promise you don't need a, a shop or a, a tuner to install one of these for you. Literally walks you through it, one of the easiest things you can do. So I've already shown you guys how to hook this thing up. Now let me show you some of the parameters and features of what we're gonna be looking at. So if we put the key in the ignition, turn it to the on position, it's going to auto start the access port. I'll let it run through its little startup process. Gives us a nice little picture of a Subaru there. Now, as you can see on my display, I have six parameters already pulled up. These are typically what I tend to monitor when driving. So in the top left, I have my dynamic advanced multiplier, uh, sensor only rear O2, so that way I can monitor AFRs that are being sent to the ECU, the intake temperature of the car, the boost, the fine knock learn, and the ethanol final content, because this car is on E85. Now, whatever you decide to set these up to is going to be up to you. If you are not on ethanol and you're on like an OTS tune or anything of that nature, I would recommend setting up dam in your top left corner. What the dam is, is that it is your dynamic advanced multiplier. So that controls the ignition tables in the ECU and the tune of whatever you're doing. So if you ever see your dynamic advanced multiplier drop below one, I'm just going to call it dam from now on. If you ever see your dam drop below one, it means that it's reducing your ignition tables. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's a multiplier. So say you have your ignition table set up in your map right there if that goes down to 0 0.750 0 0.84 or 6 or whatever it drops down to what it's doing is it's reducing the ignition tables in the car so that way if something is happening or if something is wrong because clearly the car has detected a problem it's not going to let you completely kill the car it's essentially putting itself into a safe mode so it's a global adjustment to your timing map in the ECU and I know that's a little hard to understand and like comprehend uh, but just think of it as a multiplier for your ignition tables. Uh, right under that I have rear O2 sensor. Uh, for me I run an AEM AFR gauge in this car but we have this one wired up so the OEM sensor is getting redirected to my downpipe. Now if we wanted to change that monitor for that what we're gonna end up doing is going down just clicking the down button on the access port go to the rear O2 sensor click on that one you'll see change monitor reset min max and reset current min max you're gonna hit change monitor for this demonstration we'll put it to feedback knock because that is another popular one that people like to use feedback knock so we scrolled up and down till we got to feedback knock now for me I don't monitor feedback knock because I get a lot of phantom knock from my flywheel however something to keep in mind is if you're on an OTS tune you're a relatively stock car if you see your dynamic advanced multiplier drop below whatever the predetermined value should be for this Subaru it is one um, and you're seeing a lot of feedback knock that's a good indication that something is going wrong with the car it's reducing your ignition tables and it's picking up noise on the knock sensor you can think of your knock sensor as a small hearing aid listening for certain frequencies in the engine trying to determine when knock is happening now when knock is happening if it's something that's continually happening something else that I recommend you monitor is fine knock learn what fine knock learn is going to do is it's going to to go ahead and try to adjust those tables so that way if you are picking up knock at a certain rpm range you're going to see fine knock learn go up that's not a bad thing when fine knock learn goes up what it's what the car is doing is it's taking in the information from the knock sensor to see hey we're getting negative 1.4 feedback knock at 2800 rpm let's try to correct that and over time it's going to make small adjustments to try to correct that knock within that rpm band or wherever you're at uh, to try to bring it back to where it should be so fine knock learn is a proactive 
feature that's going to help try to reduce knock. Uh, feedback knock is just a response to whatever the knock sensor is hearing inside of the engine. So if you're seeing a lot of feedback knock, it could be that there is actually feedback knock. Um, if something around the engine bay is rattling a little bit, it could be a loose bolt, loose bracket, anything of that nature in there. Um, so these are very, these three are the top three monitors I recommend you guys have up if you're on an OTS tune or a relatively stock car. Intake temperature is another one for me that I like to monitor mainly because I like to know what my IATs are because I don't want to be jumping hard on the throttle if my IATs are through the roof. On this car, we're running speed density and the IAT sensor is relocated right before the throttle body. But if you're on a math based car that's still using a math sensor, it's going to pull your intake temperatures from your math. So anything that gets passed over that math sensor in the intake is going to be what your intake temperature is. Some people also like to monitor manifold temperature. Um, for me, I prefer intake temp. Boost is another one I like. Um, even though I have a dedicated boost gauge in the car, I like to keep this one up so that way I can see what my maximum PSI is if I'm doing a poll or if I'm doing any type of data logging. It's just a good little extra piece of information to have. And then for me, also ethanol final. Um, if you are using an access port, Cobb offers a lot of extra sensors that will tie into your ECU. For my 05 STI specifically, I can monitor ethanol final content. So because this car is on E85, I can constantly see what ethanol percentage we are getting. I also have in a Cobb fuel pressure sensor, which also lets me view fuel pressure on this access port. If you do not have the additional sensors, you are not going to be able to see those parameters. You are also going to see some parameters available on other access ports for other cars that you're not going to see for yours. So for example, the 2015 plus WRX, you are able to monitor oil pressure. Um, for this one, you cannot. That is why I have a dedicated DEFI gauge for oil pressure, but that's really going to cover the parameters feature of what you can monitor. Like I said, you can go into any of these settings, go into change monitor, and you can change this to whatever you set your heart to. You want fuel pump duty cycle, fuel temperature, gear position, uh, idle airflow, hot start, low learn tables, anything like that. It is all in here. What did I have that set to before? Because now I don't remember what's whatever. I'll set it. I'll set it back later. So now that we've kind of covered that, another thing that I want to show you guys that I learned recently is how to set this up for data logging. So if you're doing any type of e-tuning with anyone, you're going to have to make some data logs and send them out. So if you go up here to this little arrow up in the top right, you click on that. It'll say change gauge layout. So you can do one gauge up to six gauges. You can change the units of the gauge. Say you're in Australia, say you're in Canada or anywhere else that doesn't use Imperial. Um, you can definitely change that to metric if you wanted. But for data logging, you're gonna go to configure data log and you're gonna click on that. Now your tuner is gonna give you a specific list of what he needs to monitor and whatever is checked inside of this I guess application in the access port is what the data log is going to monitor. So if you need injector pulse width base, I have that selected, injector duty cycle, you can monitor intake temperature, any of those parameters that we were seeing on that other set of viewable features for us is inside of this configure data log tab. You just need to make sure that you're going in there and actually adjusting the data log. So that's going to cover the main feature of the parameter section. Now, if we wanted to go back, we have some other features in here as well. You can go down, you can do performance monitoring. You can do zero to 60 time and quarter mile times on the access port. They are not accurate. I am going to tell you that right now. We are gonna be doing some testing with both of those here in the next couple videos to see what they actually come back at for what the car is making. We also have troubleshooting. So this is really another good feature about it. So we can, obviously you can identify the vehicle if you don't know what you have and maybe you bought a car with an access port, you can go in there and it'll tell you everything. Uh, memory snapshot, it's just gonna read a memory state from the ECU. I've never really needed to use that. The two that I mainly use are reading codes and reset ECU learning. So reading codes, obviously you have a check engine light. It's not going to do anything unless you have a check engine light up on the dash and the ECU is sensing that there's a problem. If you do have an issue, you can go in there, you can hit read codes, it'll scan. Please weigh the access port scanning. For us, we have no code, so no codes were found. If you do have a code, it'll tell you what the code is, and it'll also give you the code identifying number, so that way you can look a little bit more into it online if you want to. Now for reset ECU learning, this is one that I use rarely, but it is a good feature to have. So if you're having an issue with the car, say you just reflashed a tune onto it and you didn't let it properly relearn, and then you go drive the car, and it's just acting a little bit funky, the throttle doesn't feel good, or you need to reset the ECU after a check engine light's been on there, you can reset ECU learning. Now keep in mind, if you do this, it is going to reset all of the ECU parameters. So anything that the car has learned from fine knock learn, uh, throttle position, all of that stuff, it's going to take a little bit of time for the car to relearn all of that stuff. So expect it to feel a little bit laggy for a little while. Now, 
and we get to the fun stuff, the tuning features of things. So we have adjustments, change ECU map, restore OTS maps, and show current maps. So if we go up to adjustments, this is the fun stuff that we're gonna play with here in a minute. You can adjust your idle based on plus or minus 300 RPM for this car. Um, it may be different for other access ports. I haven't had to use that feature before, but it is there if you do need it. You can also adjust timing. I would not advise you play with that tab unless you know what you are doing. Wouldn't adjust timing. The ones that I would suggest playing with are flat foot shifting. So in this car, I have flat foot shifting set to, I believe, 6,500 RPM. This car revs out to about 8,000. Um, we've played with this in the past when we had the FP black on the car. It's a very fun feature to have. Um, just make sure you are using it properly. Remember, you're gonna keep your foot pegged all the way to the floor when you're shifting. And it's it's fun to play with. Um, just be careful with it. I'll just throw in like a small little clip of that one. The other one. The other one is launch control, which everyone seems to love. Nobody actually uses it. Well, for the most part, nobody actually uses it. Everyone just plays with it for the sound. And we'll do a little launch control here. Um, I'm not going to launch the car in the driveway or go out right now because obviously it's prime traffic time and it's been raining and we're going to break all four loose. So um, I have mine set to 6,500. When it comes to setting your launch control, you're going to want it set to wherever you are building boost in the power band. So if you're not building boost up until 5,000 plus, you're going to want it somewhere in that range. For me, I hit full boost around 5,000 RPM, but to keep it up there when I start to launch. I like it a little bit higher. This is gonna be different for everybody based on whatever modifications you've done to your car and wherever your power band is. So if you have like a stock STI, I'd probably set launch control to anywhere between 4,200 and 4,500 RPM. So that's gonna cover going through and navigating and then you can reset launch control flat foot shifting if you want to. Uh, but that's gonna cover going through the main features in here. If you need to flash a map on here or change your map, you just go to change ECU map, follow the prompts on the screen and it'll walk you through it and then uninstall if you need to uninstall your app if you're selling the car and you want to take the access port with you make sure you do uninstall it if you don't uninstall your access port and you leave it married to the car you can't unmarry it later after you've sold it unless you know who you sold it to so if you do not uninstall this you will have to send your access port back to Cobb they're gonna charge you I believe it's like $475 right now to go through there and uninstall access ports um, but another question that I see people ask is hey maybe I left my access port in the car the car got stolen and they stole my access port what am I supposed to do now if you plug in a new access port over this one you can rewrite ECU data so the new access port will take the place of the old access port just keep in mind that any of the saved features on your old access port will not be carried over to this one unless you have them saved on access port manager so that way you can re-upload them to the new access port but it's gonna cover the main features in the access port itself Let's go back and play with the, let's play with a little bit of launch control. See how this thing sounds and I'll show you guys how to use it. So while I wait for the car to warm up before we do this, because I'm not gonna do this cold, there's a couple things you need to keep in mind when doing launch control. You wanna make sure that you don't just dump the clutch. If you dump the clutch, it's gonna send so much shock to the drivetrain that it's, it has potential to break things. Uh, B, if you ride the clutch out, it's going to burn the clutch also. So you're gonna have to find like the happy medium for you and your car for what like the happy medium between those two are. For automatics, DC, uh, DCGs, all that kind of stuff, CVTs, uh, works a little bit differently. I believe you hold in the brake pedal, hold in the gas pedal, let off the brake, and then it does the launch control for you. So, don't blow up your car. Don't blow up your drivetrain either because that's expensive. So as you guys saw, I have my launch control set to 6,500. Um, I've got a GoPro strapped up to the tack, so that way you guys can kind of see what's going on. Still sounds like a box of rocks. It's still warming up. Give me like two minutes. All right, so now that we're up to operating temp, we are good to go. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna, I'm gonna leave my e-brake up for this because we're not actually launching, but you're gonna have your e-brake down, obviously. You're gonna go ahead, you're gonna put the car in first gear, and you're literally just gonna step on the gas. So I'm gonna blip it a couple times, uh, but you don't need to. You can just gas it out. We get fun popping noises, but. As you guys can see, it just goes there and it holds it at that RPM. Oh! Let me show you guys on the access port what it's doing when we're doing that. Um, and then we'll move on from the, uh, from the launch control part. It's just so much fun. Okay, so you guys are gonna see, when I go to do this on the access port, you're gonna see boost climb into the positives. It's not going to go very high, but it is going to go into the positives. So, let me show you. So we got the car in first gear. Do a little blip there. Little 
Oh, that was a fun pop. So you'll see when we did that, we got up to 3.13 PSI. Like I said, not high into the positives. We're just building boosts, getting into the positives. We have no load on the car, so there's only so much we can do. But launch control, it's fun stuff. So we've talked about how to install the access port, how to set it up. We've gone through the features. I've shown you launch control. We've talked about flat foot shifting. Now let's talk about some of the values that you're gonna see because that's one of the biggest things that I get questions on. Dam, knock, and feedback knock are probably the biggest three that I see. So for dam, dam is going to vary based off of what your car is. Most cars, dam value should always be one. I know for some older cars with like 16-bit ECUs, the dam value should be 16. So dam will fluctuate. Like I said, if dam values are dropping, your ignition tables are dropping as well. It's not a bad thing. It's your engine trying to safeguard itself from blowing up. Now for feedback knock, you need to take feedback knock with a grain of salt with these, especially with Subarus. Other cars may be, other cars may follow as well. With Subarus, you're going to see feedback knock up to negative 4.20. This is considered normal. It's a completely normal value. Keep in mind that every engine out there, whether it's a stock Ford Focus or if it's a highly modified STI like this one, feedback knock is always going to happen. Now the amount of feedback knock you get is the determining factor. Sometimes like with my car, you'll get phantom knock from the lightweight flywheel. You can get phantom knock from something else in the engine bay, a loose bracket, a bolt sitting near the knock sensor. Just keep in mind that up to negative 4.20, is normal. If you get a wildly out there knock value of negative 60 or something like that, you could probably write that one off as phantom knock as well and I wouldn't stress too much on that one. Now circling back to fine knock learn, what we talked about earlier, keep in mind that is a proactive feature built into the ECU to try to mitigate knock in whatever designated areas it is picking up knock values in. So if you're seeing your feedback knock go to negative 2.80, at 3200 RPM in fourth gear, don't stress it too much. It doesn't mean your engine's about to explode. The key factors to look out for when your engine is having major problems is you're seeing that dynamic advance multiplier drop and you're seeing feedback knock in conjunction with it. And when I say you see feedback knock in conjunction with it, we're talking past negative 4.20. That's primarily when you're gonna start having issues. But just because you see those values drop doesn't mean your engine's gonna blow up. It could be a couple of factors. You could have gotten bad gas from a fuel station. If you're tuned on E85 and only E85, not running a flex sensor like we are, then you may have gotten less than ideal ethanol and the car is trying to figure out what the hell is going on. So just because you see these values drop does not mean it's the end of the world. You do not have to keep your access port plugged in at all times. You can definitely take that thing off after you put your tune on the car and toss it in the glove box. The access port is a great tool to identify problems and to troubleshoot. It's also a good way to monitor things. However, if it is giving you anxiety, take it off, put it in the glove box and only use it when you need it. I've seen access ports ruin driving experiences for so many people because they get fixated on the little things about what their car is doing. Like I said, feedback knock up to negative 4.2, totally fine. If you're driving using negative 2.80, your car's not gonna blow up. Don't, have, don't let this thing give you anxiety and ruin your driving experience with the car. I've seen it happen way too many times in the past. As for all other values that are associated with the access port, that's gonna heavily depend on what you're looking at, what you're trying to troubleshoot, anything like that. I use this all the time for coolant temps whenever I'm burping the cooling system to see when the radiator fans kick on. Like I said, it's a great tool for troubleshooting when you have check engine lights, when you're doing maintenance or anything of that nature, but don't let it completely ruin your driving experience. It's not fun. It's not what it's meant. It's not what it's made for. Maybe it is. Cobb, if you made this to give people anxiety, let us know. So the last thing I do want to touch on is additional sensors that Cobb provides and other manufacturers, Visconti Tuning, iWire, and some other ones out there. But for this example, we're going to use Cobb. So here's the Cobb fuel pressure sensor. This is what senses the signal of fuel pressure and sends it to the ECU via the stock wiring harness. We have the TGV harness reconfigured to read 
fuel pressure. Same with our ethanol sensor down here. It reads off of the old TGV plugs and then reads ethanol content, sends it to the ECU and then sends it to our access port. So you can definitely monitor other things in the engine if you want to. Uh, just keep in mind that you may have to purchase additional sensors to be able to do so. It's a great feature to be able to add on whenever you want it to, but so not all sensors come with the car, unfortunately, which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. But that's all I've got for you guys on this one. So I know a lot of access port questions will still come up and I will do my best to get back to all of you guys and answer your questions to the best of my ability. I'm still going through and learning a lot of the tuning parameters and ECU parameters of everything, going through some of High Performance Academy's shameless plug courses online and if you guys are looking to expand your knowledge i'll leave a link below to their efi tuning course um, which is actually a really good course if course if you're just wanting to learn the fundamentals of what is going on inside of your ecu and I'll throw a discount code down there for you guys also. But that's all I got for you guys on this one. I hope the video helped. I hope it helped clear up some of the mis like misconstruencies, I guess, or confusion. If you just got an access port or if you've had one, maybe learn something new. I don't know. If there's anything that you feel like I missed out or left out, please drop it down below in the comments. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel and you want to be one of these corners, no idea which one I'll throw it in quite yet. But with that, I will catch you guys in the next one. Peace out, homies. <laughs>